<laughs> well, I'm glad all of you are here because um, I'm going to be talking about uh, an informal, uh, fundamentally unfunded uh, experiment that I've been doing by turning my body into a genomic and biomarker observatory uh, over the last uh, period of eight years or so. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up being a general relativistic astrophysicist. I spent 25 years studying highly nonlinear dynamic systems, which, you know, like magnetohydrodynamic accretion onto black holes and computing all of that on, on Cray supercomputers, and thought that was pretty complex. But it turns out that the human body is vastly more complex than any astronomical system. And yet we don't treat it like the dynamic nonlinear coupled system it is. And if you think about um, you know, why Transmark is moving into longitudinal time series, it's like, well, what else would you do? I mean, if, you, if you're an astronomer, you see something go weird in the sky, it's just a point there. That's all it is. There's no dimension to it. And so all you can do is watch it over time and see how it oscillates in various variables and, and then from that infer what must be going on. I think that's the future of precision medicine. It's very different than this sitting outside the body, looking at epiphenomena like symptoms, uh, and then trying to guess what might be going on inside. And as I'll show you, that really can't work in any kind of detail. Um, and so I actually was, uh, I don't have a typical biomedical background. It's like I say, physics and computer science. but if you, if you approach a system like this with that system dynamics attitude, then you end up doing things very differently than you would otherwise. So what you see here on this wall is 20 years of me. Now, I have to say that uh, back in the day, this is like how often I was normally getting tested, right? Uh, that would be the normal medical approach. And then I got into saying, well, look, if I'm really going to understand this, I've got to go to much higher time frequency. And in fact, now I'm doing most of this every two weeks, uh, and we'll get into what that resulting is. But I didn't think I was, I thought I was healthy when I started this. And um, what I've discovered is that actually I have a chronic incurable disease, an autoimmune disease. And I had to figure that out by using data. And I think that's the kind of thing we're going to see more and more of. So if you want to know, well, why, how could that be? Well, the way we've done it is these are everything from your liver enzymes to your cholesterol. To just, this is just uh, a subset of about, oh, I don't know, 200 things that I follow in my blood and, and my stool over time. And if they're in the healthy range, then the healthy range is green. The yellow is 1 to 10 times above the upper limit for healthy. The orange is... Uh, 10 to 100 times the upper limit for healthy, and the purple is over 100 times the upper limit for healthy. Uh, and, and so when you just look at this, it's sort of like the radiologist throwing up things on the, on the light board, and you say, okay, what's wrong with this person? And you can see, well, first of all, this person is chronically inflamed. So this is your complex reactive protein in your blood, which is your generic me measure of inflammation. Second of all, if you look at what else is going on, well, lysozyme is in the stool. It's the point defense on the colon wall uh, against uh, bacteria, gram-positive bacteria that it doesn't like. It's the innate immune system. It's been there since sea urchins developed the tube as a biological s structure. Um, and you can see it's way out of range, so that's your innate immune system. Secretory IgA is your most common um, antibody in your... Uh, colon and your and in, in your it comes out and you measure it through the stool again you can see that the adaptive that's your antibodies are are going crazy so you've got inflamed you've got immune disorder and then lactoferrin and calprotectin are from the third component of your immune system the uh, white blood cells the neutrophils which are the killer white blood cells when they're in attack mode and one thing they do is shed glycoproteins from their surface is an antimicrobial agent, in particular, like lactoferrin sequesters iron away from bugs that need it, like salmonella and other sorts of things. 
So just by looking at this, you can say, well, this person has an inflammation um, immune problem, probably some sort of autoimmune. You can then go into the literature, and I love what Julius is saying about being able to <laughs> go through the literature. That's what I've done. I, I basically self-taught myself over using, you know, five, seven hundred scientific papers to step by step. So you start with lactoferrin. I said, what's lactoferrin, right? <laughs> So you start figuring out it's lacto because it's in mother's milk, and it's ferrin because it, it, it uh, sequesters iron. And uh, it's one of the main things that you see. Kids, for instance, pe pediatric wards like in the Rady Children's Hospital, one of the things they do for studying whether the kid might have IBD is they look at lactoferrin and calprotectin because the kid produces plenty of sample. Anyway, so you then look in the literature, and it turns out that to get a lactoferrin of 900, which is up there, that spike, 899, um, for a, something that's supposed to be less than seven in healthy people is the sensitive and specific indicator that you've got IBD, in, inflammatory bowel disease. Doesn't work with IBS, you might get up to 10 or something, you know, 15, 20, not 900. That's active IBD. And so that was such a wake-up call to me. I had no idea what the hell. Like, did I miss the memo? How can I be like, you know, I'm 68 now. Like, when I was 60, I started figuring this out. It's like, how could I wait that long? And you think, well, in particular, as we'll find out, it's, it's a form of Crohn's. Crohn's actually hits kids often when they're teenagers. The actual peak in the diagnosis is at 20, age 20. I'm 60, it didn't have it. So what's going on? Well, it turns out because we'll see there's a whole bunch of different subtypes of these autoimmune diseases that we don't really understand yet, but we will because of the genetic and the microbiome data. So if you say, well, let's look at the phasing and time of these. So let's just pick these five variables I just talked about in the blood, the CRP, and then in the stool, the calprotectin, lactoferrin, lysozyme, and secretory IgA. Now what you can see, and, you, and this is one of the things that Transmart will get into when it really starts having a lot of longitudinal data, is that phase information is very important because what that's saying is are all the components of the immune system acting in unison or because they're called for from, you know, different things being upset? If you don't have gram-positive bacteria, it's not going to call out lysozyme because that doesn't do anything else to, <laughs> you know, and so forth. So if the bugs don't need iron, they're not going to call out lactoferrin, right? The body's pretty smart and the immune system in particular, but it's an AI system. It's, it's trained up from the changing microbiome when you're born, your immune system comes from figuring out whether the increasing diversity of your microbiome until age three, and uh, Rob Knight will probably talk about that uh, in the closing keynote, um, uh, is that a friend? Oh, is that self or other? And then they make a memory cell. And so basically, you, your immune system is derivative <laughs> of your microbiome. And that's why if you're C-section versus vaginal, if you have breastfed or you're not breastfed, if you got tons of antibiotics because you got the kids screaming because they got an ear infection, even though it's viral, they give them antibiotics, then they're screwed up in terms of their microbiome. And that's why you have much higher rates of uh, autoimmune asthma and everything else if it's not done the way that nature evolved, co-evolved the microbiome on the host to expect. Anyway, that's another state. That's another story. But what you can see here is when my CRP hit 27, which is the blue line, it turned out that the calprotectin was also very high. So some aspect of my systemic blood reaction was going on at the same time as the microbiome. But you'll notice at that point in time, if you put the cursor back on the red, uh, the red dot up there, yeah, you'll notice that the others are down here. They're normal. Now, if you happen to look at those things, if your doctor said, let's do some tests, but he looked at these and not those, he'd say you're normal. Right? And yet a month later, if you go over here, the orange, which is down at the very bottom, is at the very top. And this is the real problem. Humans, particularly in a disease state, are way more dynamic than we think they are. And we, the methodology that medicine uses today of, well, you're doing too many tests and, you know, I'll let, you know, I mean, this is just going to go. Okay? And it has to mean that the cost to get these numbers have got to come way down. But, you know, like Sumo Logic in this town, other startups, you can get 5,000 proteins out of a drop of blood, you know. It's, it's, you know, drop of blood's a lot, pretty big compared to protein. And so, uh, and these are all proteins, by the way. 
<laughs> you know, lysozyme is an enzyme, it's protein. Antibody, that's protein. Complex reactive protein, right? So, so that's one reason that you're going to see the ability using proteomics and a lot of other things to bring this all down. You'll also notice that there's macro. I had a attack over here uh, that it, at the time I had no idea what it was. And then I had this period of remission. Now, if you were doing predictive precision medicine, as we all do with our cars, we don't wait till smoke comes out of the hood, the way when I grew up, and then you say, uh-oh, I have a chronic disease. I better go to the garage, doctor. And, and of course, they said, oh, well, you burned the rings out. You know, it's going to cost you. You know, you're, you're in big trouble. No, what you do is you have, because of, thank God, flash memory, we can sensors, we just keep track of, the, of every vital sign over time. Not because there's anything wrong with it, but because you want to know when it begins to get wrong, which is long before you get a symptom. And Lee Hood made this point 20 years ago and with mouse models of, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, that's what you would be doing. So what you'd be saying is you'd be monitoring along and then all of a sudden, about here, you say, wait a minute, this doesn't look good. Things are beginning to diverge. And if you intervened here with something that wouldn't take that much, you might have avoided all of this. And you say, well, okay, did you feel bad? So what I did was every day I wrote down anything that went wrong with my body. And these are each tracks. These are different symptoms. Now, how many MDs do we have? Okay. So I don't want to get all clinical on you and talk about bleeding and flaring and all this kind of stuff that goes on with this. But just say that each of these is a different thing. Like, for instance, take one that's not so ucky. Uh, like, you get arthritis in your hands as well because there are a couple different kinds of autoimmune things. You get burning eyes. You get blood marks that appear on your skin, that sort of thing. That's a peripheral, I call it. And so that's, say, uh, you know, one of these, this one, I guess. Um, but then each of these is a week uh, of, of time. If it's white, I didn't have the symptom. And then if it's not very much, it's, it's like this. And if it's very dark, then I, it's the worst as it was, right? So, you know, when I go into the doctor and they say, well, how are you feeling? Uh, and I said, well, is that a serious question? Because if so, I got um, five times 52 weeks a year times seven years worth of answers for you. So then the other thing is, okay, well, say you're feeling bad. Does that mean that you're, this, like here, this looks pretty bad. Biomarkers are essentially normal. And if you come over to, I don't know, say this point, which is the worst it ever gets, it actually, go over just a little more, 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 right in the middle of the dot. Yeah. Nothing's going on that week. So the idea is flawed that you can intuit the actual state of the biological variables that determine the state of your body, your, your immune system, your, your biomarkers. You can't. So given that you can't, but you can now measure the biomarkers, wouldn't that make more sense to invert the whole field of medicine to one that's based on data science? And so then you can go into these are pharmaceutical products. And then the green dots are frozen stool samples, 80 below zero, that I are going back with Rob and his lab. And we're then deeply mining the microbiome. So that's what I want to talk about mostly. Um, and you can see that that gives us now longitudinal microbiomes, which TransSmart trans -smart needs to have in its longitudinal. <laughs> um, OK. So, any questions about that? Okay. So, then, um, the question is, well, do you really have, if you've got IBD, what form of IBD do you have? Um, and so, this is where imaging that we heard about comes in. And, um, so this is what, if you do an MRI, this is from my 2012. And so I, you know, all this data is available to you. 
Uh, this is a 3D version, so this down here is the aorta. This split is in the two iliac arteries that go down your legs. Um, it's a little hard to see right here, but this is your, trans your sigmoid colon, and this is a cross-section through it with a cutting plane. So we just take the DICOM format that comes out of the MRI or the CAT scan, and then we turn that into a three-dimensional uh, virtual reality. Now, if you look at this, you know, there's the liver, there's the transverse colon, small intestine, but then what's that thing? Okay, and that is actually how I found out where the problem was. It's just in this six inches, essentially, of the sigmoid colon that the inflammation is. And I'll, I'll spare you the internal colonoscopy pictures, which are really interesting. Um, but when you put it in 3D, it's a lot easier to see. And I spend hours with the MD radiologist in their black room looking at the black and white slices. But what you can see here is that the sigmoid comes down, goes through this funny kink and around across here and then back through and then eventually down into the rectum. Um, and this doesn't look good. <laughs> well, because it's digital, you can of course just pull it out as an organ and you can then see diverticula from the outside, which you know colonoscopists never see. And then you can cut it through and you can see that the lumen, the, the thing that all your stool flows through to get to the end, is very narrow and that this is very swollen. And in fact, that's the inflammation that came from the white blood cells that were in attack mode because this is, says it's Crohn's basically, that, the, that instead of being a surface of the intestine, which is what ulcerative colitis is, Crohn's is actually attacking the wall of the uh, intestine. Okay, well, if that's the case, that was how we figured it out back in uh, 2012 that it must be uh, what is a colonic Crohn's, which is a form of, of IBD. But then why would I have it? Well, then this gets into what we heard uh, this morning from Keith, um, GWAS, right? So you'd say, well, and I've got my whole human genome done a couple of times. I was with George Church's original pro project at Harvard and then with Lee Hood's uh, at uh, Seattle. And it's known, this is from uh, uh, David Relman at, at Stanford, uh, that when you have an autoimmune disease, there's three things that are coupled together. It's the, uh, it's the host genetics, the immune dysfunction, which you clearly have seen over time I have, and then the microbiome, which we'll get to in a second. So I've been quantifying all three. And the point to this is not, I mean, it's, it's sort of mildly useful to for me, but it's much more that I'm using this as an example of the way it's going to be in the future when data science is, you know, medicine is a subfield of data science. Um, and that's what this institute was built for when I found it at 15 years ago, is to essentially live in the future and report back and thereby give us earlier views of the way things are going so that um, uh, we can um, prepare. So it turns out that uh, I'm actually going to get, the, this has gotten so thick, the, the wall thickness now, instead of three millimeters, it's up to over 23 millimeters. And it's riven with tunnels and things like that. It's not a good situation. So I'm actually going to have it resected uh, later this year using, and this is how cool does it get, the Da Vinci robots as a surgical assist. Now, that means that the surgeon is sitting here looking in 3D, because the, there's two cameras in, in the Da Vinci, in stereo. Well, guess what? She can be looking and doing surgical planning on the 3D of the one she's got, the individual she's actually going to be cutting on before the operation. And so this afternoon, I'll hang around and talk with you a little bit, but by 1 o'clock I have to be over at the MRI drinking my first of three bottles of barium sulfate and then getting my two IVs that I'll be needing for the vascular contrast and then they're going to have to paralyze my peristalsis to keep me still enough that we can hopefully get to a sub-millimeter resolution MRI and then tomorrow we'll be turning that into the Gen 2 of this and then I'll be working with her to actually plan this and we're working with the company because they can actually bring in the MRI and then you can actually do a fly through just like pilots do of the actual surgery you're about to do. Now this is not done. 
And UCSD is, I mean, it is a few experimental places, but at this university it isn't. Even all the piece parts are here. And it's because without this kind of institute where you can pull together these cross-disciplinary teams and without a willing victim uh, to provide a body, um, it's a little bit difficult to play with this. But let's go back to the human DNA. When you, I was one of the early adopters of 23andMe. And when you look at Crohn's, if you just put that in the search list you used to be able to before the FDA, um, what you see is that there's this big red bar, which is an 80% uh, increased likelihood of a uh, problem because it's one of the interleukin uh, cytokines that are uh, sort of inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and dynamic balance in your body. And it's just, you know, the, there's an ART instead of a C or a G, so on that, you know, gene that happens to be on the first chromosome. Uh, and so it's more pro-inflammatory. Um, and in fact, it was one of the very first ones identified and um, is now a master regular, has known, been known now for a number of years. Well, but I thought, is that the same as Crohn's like hits teenagers? Well, it turned out that my, <clears throat> I have a <clears throat> friend whose daughter had it, so I gave her a tube of the classic ileal Crohn's, which is uh, what you get uh, when you're uh, in your teenagers. And you can see she's got the classic nod too, but not the one that I have. And so already you can begin to see, well, this makes logical sense. Each of these SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are in different parts of your DNA. They're either on genes or in the control regions in between, the introns, and they are affecting different parts of your immune system. And so as that slightly off immune system goes through life, it ought to come out with a different symptom. And, and so when you, you can look at this also in terms of ulcerative colitis, um, and uh, it turns out that then if you uh, look at across, I don't know, tens of thousands or so of, of IBDs that have been looked at through GWAS, you find out that <clears throat> for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, this is the width of the explanation of the variance from that particular SNP. And the big ones, interleukin-23, what I have, and NOD2, which is the ileal Crohn's, um, pretty well define it, but there are 163 SNPs. <laughs> so it turns out that I started talking with 23andMe along with a number of others, and they have now collected over 10,000 IBD patients with their SNPs. Now this is revolutionary. This means that you are going to now be able on disease by disease case, create the genetic cohorts that have the same thing wrong with their DNA and then study those together because they're logically a group that you'd expect to have a, a common outcome. That is not in medicine today. It's, it is the revolution that's happened in cancer genomics, but that's just one area that's it's starting, okay? So I think this is gonna be huge, and I was, that's why I was so pleased to see Transmart uh, um, having uh, that in, in there. So, so to understand this autoimmune then, you've, you've understood that, that the human genome is a part of it. Uh, let's go to the um, microbiome. But 90% of the DNA-bearing cells in your body are not human. They're microbes. And 99% of the genes on the DNA in your body is not human. So just having the human genome in Transmart isn't going to cut it for understanding what's really wrong with you. You've got to have the massive amount of genes which are in your microbial DNA. Now to get that, you have to sequence. Now many of you know that when you, most papers in the literature on sequencing the microbiome use 16S. What that means is you take one of the 5,000 genes on a, on a bacteria like E. coli, you use that as sort of the marker gene to separate different species. And that takes about 20,000 Illumina short reads of a, a sequencing. Uh, a short read is about 100 bases. So say 20,000 of those. What I'm gonna show you is 100 or 200 million short reads per sample. So 10,000 times the genetic depth that you get in the standard 16S. 16S is fine as a surveillance, but to really understand the genes, which is really why there's a difference in the diseases, you have to go here. So what we did uh, over the last few years is um, uh, 
I had developed for environmental microbiome. I had a 20 some million dollar grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to set up a global repository for the emerging sets of metagenomics on environmental data and then make that available around the world along with software, much all on open source, much, much like Transmart's uh, model. Um, and then starting 2010 or something like that, I noticed that a few ecological niches, so normally it's the ocean or, you know, Craig Venner went around the ocean, sequenced the ocean, or it's Yellowstone Hot Springs or somewhere, was the niche that the microbes were in. They started saying human gut. And I said, why are these medical guys coming in and messing up my environmental microbiome center? And then I realized it's just another environmental niche. <laughs> so we had all the software developed to take these huge metagenomic data sets. And I want to say Jeff Grethy here, if you want to raise your hand again. Jeff was a critical member of the team that, that, that oversaw all of that development and, um, and that uh, we ended up with 6,000 users in 60 countries around the world. Uh, and Jeff was number one man uh, throughout this. So he's a great person to have involved with you. But the point is, we then took it and put it through the supercomputer. We used about, um, I don't know, 25 CPU years. So burn your computer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for 25 years uh, to get this data. So we downloaded the actual raw reads from the Human Microbiome Project of the 255 healthy people, then compared that against the reference database of all known uh, microbial genomes. And what you get now is this is an average over healthy people by species. So this is the bacterial vulgaris and bacterial vatus. These are the two most common uh, bugs in your, and, and you'll notice this is a log scale. So that's about 10% of your, you know, 50 trillion <laughs> are one species. But notice it's a log scale. So what that means is you have a parallel fall off in the relative abundance of these things. Now I've divided it by phylum. How many people know what a phylum is? Okay. So when you think about biodiversity on the earth, so you know you're giving money the world like I do to the World Wildlife Federation or something like that foundation, um, you're thinking, wow, look at all the wonderful biodiversity there is on Earth, right? Well, it turns out these are all, these are all vertebrates. <laughs> They're a subphylum called chordata, things with spinal cord, okay? So to understand multi-phylum ecologies, like your gut or your skin, uh, vagina, etc., you need to add in, say, all the insects, the shells, the segmented worms, the radially symmetric, the corals and, and jellyfishes and so forth. So that's the level of biodiversity. You need to think of yourself as the center of the Amazon rainforest or a coral reef in terms of the uh, enormous biodiversity that's inside of you. Now, let's see how we are doing about that, uh, since we're going to be, uh, you know, taking care of human beings. Well, do we know what it is? Do we know what's inside of each of you in terms of your microbiome? That'd be a negative. Do we care? No. Do we go in and massively napalm it with antibiotics? Do we care to see what the results of that are? No. That's the current state of medicine for 99% of your genes, the software of your body. It will change radically in the next five to ten years because of the exponential decrease in sequencing. Until this, mil this would have cost, this project would have cost one million times as much money to do just ten or fifteen years ago. That's why it can only be done now. But that continuing decrease in cost along with the biomarkers is what's going to make this all practical. I don't suggest you do this at home right yet but it's coming. So, um, I've colored these by the phylum. So the two big ones, the Bacteriotes and the Firmicutes, are the red and the blue. And then the purple are the Proteobacteria. These are the Antenobacteria. And these are, just think of those as like, you know, animals and plants and insects and whatever. Okay. Now, um, 
you might care, say, well, why, Larry, what, you burned all that computer time to figure this out at such accuracy. Who cares about the weeds? Really? I mean, that's a factor of 10, 100, down. Oh, Clostridium difficile. In the healthy people, it's down at only two hundredths of a percent. But if you go in and get massive antibiotics and they wipe out the guys whose one of their main ecological services is to keep the weeds down, that kills 20,000 Americans a year. Makes hundreds of thousands sick, two-thirds of which happen in hospitals. So it does matter. All these bugs matter because depending on the environmental pressures, the Darwinian selection pressures, this evolves on an hourly basis. <laughs> and it will simply adapt to whatever the pressures are. And that adaption, since these make about 20% of the metabolites in your body, and that bathes every organ in your body, when your bugs aren't happy, you ain't happy. You just don't know why. Okay, so now let's compare this and say, well, how out of whack could your microbiome get in a disease state? So let's compare this with, say, ileo Crohn's. And what you'll notice, this is a set of uh, people who had been sequenced um, on the, um, uh, uh, through the NIH. Um, you'll notice that the bacteriotes, which are 77% of the phylum, are reduced to one and a half percent, fifty-fold reduction, and the actinobacteria, which were a tiny little trace in the healthy people, are hundred times greater than now a quarter of your microbes. Okay, this is radically different, and it will have a radical difference on every organ in your body because of the metabolites that they produce are quite different. Not to mention the proteomics. So I should say for each of these samples we are doing now the full proteomics and metabolomics um, as well as deep metagenomics to do the integrative omics. Yeah. Yes ma'am. So this is about 15 samples. So what we're doing now is we're working with uh, Dr. Bill Sanborn who leads the GI uh, division at UCSD and one of the top IBD clinics in the country. He was 20 years at the Mayo Clinic before that and uh, he has a biobank which has both blood and stool of now over 300 of his patients. So we are taking, Rob and I are now working together to take about 100 of those that have been very carefully phenotyped. Age, sex, age of first onset, digital colonoscopy saved in the biobank. Uh, so you can see the details of the internal thing. Uh, because of its blood, we can do their genomic differences. Uh, we can now do the microbiome, we can do the metabolome, we can do the proteome, and we're setting out to do that. And we were just granted uh, 1 million CPU hours on the San Diego Supercomputer Center. That's one CPU century uh, that we'll be using to that, do that. So we will have, this time next year, the first really high resolution map down to the individual genes. We'll have the relative abundance of the genes. Remember, there's 5,000 genes per each of these bugs. Okay, We will have that relative abundance for the first time across healthy people and then across these different disease states. Okay, let's, um, so, I mean, I could spend all day here. So I'll just show you a few things. Let's look at the uh, time uh, uh, variation. So where we're going with this is not, what I'm showing you here is population comparisons, and that's very important, but it's at one moment in time. Uh, what you can see here is me over a year and a half. This is just with uh, uh, seven samples, but we've now got 80 of them that are being sequenced. And each of these is a bug, like this here is E. coli. Now most folks, like most of you have a few tenths of a percent in your, in your gut right now. I had 10%. And you can see though, I mean, <laughs> this is November of 2012, this is January. Most of us wouldn't go in, even if the doctor did do microbiome, and expect anything much to change in two months. But remember what the natural time scale of this nonlinear dynamic system is. The individual microbes are dividing 
on a time scale of hours. Two months is a long time compared to an hour. <laughs> so Rob has done his every day for six years. And we're going to then, this is a sort of geek heaven I live in. We're going to have a data bake off between his time series and my time series. And I'm going to win because he's healthy. And so his dynamics are going to be boring. <laughs> I'm going to wipe him. I mean, I, I am, I, you can ask him. Um, no question. I am going to have way more interesting dynamics. Um, but this is the, the reason I show you this is you've got to understand what the nature of the system is you are studying. If you want to do it right, it's highly dynamic. What before you saw was on a 20-year time scale, the biomarkers, and you were seeing things going up and down, but that's on the scale of months, right? These things are going up and down on the scale of days. And, in fact, there's been research now where they've changed the diet, say, from paleo to vegan, and within days, the microbiome has completely changed in terms of its composition. The, yeah? So she says, have, have you seen that the microbiome, which is a non-invasive test, right? You don't have to do anything but what you normally do, just save a little of it, um, and send it off to the lab. Uh, can it predict something? Well, it, it turns out that uh, we've just done an experiment like that using machine learning and on the time series. And um, it looks as if the variation in the ecology can have a very high prediction with, say, your BMI or with other variables. And so we're just starting into that now. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, this is about from here to here is about 30 feet of GI tract. And your stool is an integrated function of that journey. And in my case, I have this inflammation just here. But the rest of me is pretty in pink, if you actually spend 10 hours looking at the internal uh, colonoscopy video like I have. Um, geek fun. What do you do to relax? Anyway, um, so, uh, you know, my guess is, and we're beginning to do a set of experiments, if you take a production of your stool and you sample, core it like here, you're going to get different results. Remember, per gram, gram of stool, you have one billion microbes in that one gram. And you compare a micron as their natural length scale to the length of a piece of stool. You know, it's like planetary dimensions, you know, solar system. <laughs> so, yes, and, and I think that's one of the real problems. So from a protocol point of view, should you take various samples and wearing blend them together and then sequence that? Or is the actual variation telling you something itself? And those are questions for the future. And by the way, anybody else has questions, jump in. Um, yeah. Yeah, so 85% of these species are anaerobic, so die in the presence of oxygen. Um, and so how you do the sample preparation can make a big difference. Uh, one thing I would love is that they did time samples on the mice, so I wouldn't have to do it on me. But people who do mice seem to like to just kill them and then cut them up and then get another mouse, and, and, and they don't have the patience or whatever to... Anyway, it doesn't happen. I mean, there, and there, there's nothing in the scientific literature, as far as I know, that show these kind of longitudinal time series for the bio, human biomarkers, which I think is completely nuts in 2016. But it's because of a sort of a prejudice against that. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the move, I mean, look, the pendulum is swinging. Longitudinal time series are the future. And, and you're seeing the more advanced, I mean, people like Mike Snyder, who's head of gen genomics at Stanford, has been, besides me, the most quantified person in the country. 
I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but it's going to take a huge conceptual shift. And one of the things that I'm hoping is that Transmart, by having the longitudinal data, if we can get the right kind of graphics and everything to go with it, so that you can begin to uh, d discover things with the longitudinal things, not just hold it. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Yes. And also, this is just probably more than a sequence we found. I'm not necessarily reflecting all kinds of known the data. Right. It's a good approach, but still, there are so many things we have to consider. For most of all, I just have to remind me, it is some kind of very complicated dynamics with interaction between the species. Yes. Yes. That is the science we have to discover. That's the point. So, for instance, this time series, why did my E. coli all of a sudden go away? Because of the interaction with the host immune system. So, what we're doing now is taking the time series that you saw of the inflammatory and the immune markers, laying that over the species and up the phylum, actually down to the strain level, uh, variation relative abundance because they're totally interacting with each other but no one's worked that out only by having the longitudinal time series of both the biomarkers and the microbiome in a computational framework like Transmart where you can actually do this work are you going to ever figure that out but in 10 years people will say well how do we ever figure anything out if we didn't understand that so it's going to become totally routine and that's the beauty of exponentials, is that they turn the impossible into the routine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for instance, when I showed you um, the um, chart of the SNPs. Um, when you, you'd think, well, boy, we, we're going to know everything now about IBD because we know 163 SNPs. You total up the variance, 20% at best. 80% of then why you have the disease is environment. Now, when we think of environment, we think of what you mentioned, radiation or maybe even things like, uh, you know, human stressing or something. But let's remember that you, each of you, topologically speaking, is a torus. That's like a donut. So I'll give you a hint. The hole at the top is this one. So that the GI tract is the same as your skin. And you are in all of your internal organs and everything about you are encased inside donut. So the bugs in your gut are on the outside of your body and therefore in the environment. And all the food that is coming down and drink and everything else is from the outside and part of the environment. So when we talk about the host microbiome interaction, we are fundamentally talking about the host environmental interaction. This is your near environment. Now, smoking, for instance, is something that is a, uh, definitely uh, associated a risk re with, with IBD and so forth. That's an environmental variable. Stress is totally important. Stress, lack of sleep. The four pillars of health are basically nutrition, exercise, stress, management, and sleep. You do those four things well and you're in the top 1% you know, of the population. If you don't do them, they directly impact your microbiome because of the brain-gut axes. There's a super highway of both neural connections like the vagus nerve and then also the whole cytokines, hormonal, all the long-range messenger molecules that tie them together. And um, so, yeah, your mood totally changes these biomarkers. Yeah, and so I do try to keep track of that. Yeah. Yeah. So do I keep track of the nutrition? Well, 
to really keep track of the nutrition at a level that would be any use uh, is a lot of work. I, I spent about a month quantifying every gram of material that went into my mouth. Um, and that means since we cook everything from scratch and it's, you know, all, you know, local, organic, everything else, you've got to measure a lot of stuff. And then you go back to tables, which aren't all that accurate in the USDA. And then I converted it into calories, uh, protein, fat, carbohydrate, fiber, salt, and uh, sugar. And then I did that over that period of time. Um, and you can use that if you wanted to with this. If you're healthy, that actually might be the dominant issue. Um, but if you're unhealthy, these other drivers are probably going to be more uh, relevant. But considering that the average American gets something like 20% of their calories from sugared carbonated drinks, there's bigger problems here. So if there is a few, there is a few public health measures we could take in this country if we had the guts to do it, but we don't. The money's too much in the pseudo food industry to prevent us from actually having a healthy environment in food. And we all, you know, 40 years into the obesity epidemic, two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. There's a reason for that. And yet we won't do anything about it the way we did with smoking. Yeah. 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 Right. So the question is, how frequent should you use it? Now, what I love about this is when I first started this, and even today, people think, okay, SMAR is really lost at this time. Okay, th this is completely insane. Uh, you should, I have doctors tell me, you should not do this. If you, need a t if you need blood test, we'll tell you you need blood test, and we'll tell you which ones. Um, and... Uh, uh, and I said, well, this is data science. And I said, yeah, but I'm a doctor. What, what is that useful for? Um, so there's got to be a complete disruption of the status quo. We see that all the time happening. File sharing and tower records didn't work out too well after that. Um, and, the whole, and then Steve Jobs invents iTunes and the whole world changes. That's the thing you're going to see in medicine. There are plenty of doctors who get that this is coming, but they don't have the colleagues to work with. And so that's one of the things we do is put a lot of these teams together. That's what we're going to be doing for my quantified surgery is to actually make it a translational prototype so that as this uh, ability to use the data that's in the imaging directly in the surgery, that will be hopefully become standard procedure. Um, and I'm not the only one doing this. There are more and more people doing this, and there's more and more movements, a lot of the open source, uh, crowd-funded, crowd-supported uh, things I think are going to be the main disruptors. I think it's going to come from the outside, not the inside, because we can't wait for another 20 years for a new bunch of medical students. You think our medical students, I, I give the one-hour lecture on the microbiome they get out of 60 lectures. And this is for the pharmaceutical students as well as the medical students. Now that's pretty pathetic if I'm the best they can do. Now, now that Rob's here, maybe he'll talk. But I mean, we're not changing it. We're not, we're not teaching them R. We're not teaching them, you know, getting them on GitHub. I mean, come on, that's the future. And, and so we can't wait for that. So I think the sort of things like, like Julie talked about, uh, you know, these are, are coming from outside. And you see J&J, &J, Janssen, and others that are, you know, have laboratories that are working in the future. And that's just the sort of what you'd expect. That's the early changes toward a completely disrupted and reformed system. And I think you guys have a chance to really be at the vanguard of that because of the platform you've got, the Transmart platform, and, and the fact that you've made it open source so you can get whoever in the world has the best idea on something like this uh, to put that into it, and then everybody else has it, right? So, you know, I, I, I do feel that what they said about getting more data sets is really critical. Um, so I'll talk to them about whether or not, for instance, this, these data sets could be made part of that. I don't know whether that would be useful, but we could at least talk about it. I think that's enough. We need time for a break. I'll be here to talk to you um, during my hour before I have to start my procedure on <laughs> the MRI. Uh, any other questions?
Yeah. One, one over here. Ah, so what changes do I expect post-surgery? Well, I don't know. I don't expect. That's not a scientific attitude. <laughs> I will measure. Uh, having hypothesis, absolutely having hypothesis is. Well, for instance, one of the things I haven't told you about is one of the things that we have across the next building over in bioengineering. Think where we would be in heart science if we didn't have EKGs. Well, why do you have electrical activity from your heart? It's because of the muscle. Well, guess what your GI tract is? And guess what? It has electrical activity, and there's an EGG that you can actually do, and we don't do that, right? But our guys have developed techniques using similar sensors. And so I recently, about a week, two weeks ago, I had a four by four array of those sensors that I wore for 24 hours um, to gather the pre-surgery uh, uh, electrical activity of the entire small and large intestine. And, and with this blockage here, you're gonna get reflected waves, you're gonna get all kinds of things. So, so we will redo that after the surgery. In fact, I'm planning on having the graduate students come over uh, as visitors when I'm in my three to five days after the surgery and secretly plant all of the, the electrodes on me so we can get, because think about it, you cut out like a foot, you bring this together, well you gotta pull all these nerves and all the vasculature that are attached to this thing. Think of the phasing in time. You've got spatial phasing that allows peristalsis to happen, right? When this guy's squeezing, this one's letting go, and it has to be, you know, in a pattern, right? Now, this, everything they've done for 68 years is disrupted. You put these back together and you think they're just gonna figure it out, the nerves, on their own? Well, evidently they will, but for at least a few days, doesn't work. Well, what if we could be measuring that prior transition? I got nothing to do but lay in bed, might as well be generating data, right? <laughs> so we plan to do that, and we're gonna be taking detailed bio, we're gonna try to re save the resected part and use a special protocol to freeze it so that we can do detailed microbiome and um, meta metabolomic and proteomic uh, through the wall, for instance, um, as well as then, you know, afterwards, and then see the time series. Hopefully you'll see a body heal itself, but if it doesn't, we'll see that as well. That'll be also useful. Okay, thanks.